Welcome to another digital tourism show. In this video, we have the pleasure of hearing from Jack McKenna, whose presentation will be about design thinking and innovation for the travel space. Jack works for the Clydesdale Bank Accelerator program and him and his team have developed a new app called B Currency. This app was developed in as little as 12 weeks and has already won an award. The app allows people to simply use their phone to scan a foreign currency and it will automatically convert that on the fly. If you are interested in travel and tech, you do not want to miss this video. Hi, it's Chris. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Jack McKenna. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm a technology consultant working for Clydesdale Bank. Um, I've had about six years experience working in the fields broadly of digital, um, mainly digital customer experience. However, I have dabbled in uh, e-commerce uh, and done some digital marketing as well in my time. Um, in terms of my time at, at Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank Group, I've been here for one year. I think importantly for this presentation, uh, I have had no prior professional experience in the travel space or indeed in banking. So uh, in terms of the methodology that I'm going to talk you through and how we applied it, uh, it almost worked to my benefit uh, that I was uh, a little bit ignorant uh, in this space. Uh, the team that I work in is called the Accelerator. <clears throat> so our purpose uh, within this bank uh, is to rapidly assess and, and develop new and innovative ideas uh, and take them to market in a, in a slightly different way than from what a big organisation like Clydesdale Bank would typically do. Uh, that tends to be in the form of proof of concepts uh, and ra rapid iteration uh, and prototyping rather than big bang, uh, very expensive, costly um, change programs. Um, we follow a different path to live and use new ways of working, one of which is design thinking, which I'll come back to and we can, we can talk about and explore as a methodology. Uh, and we work with third parties for, for two main reasons. One is to develop our proposition in some way, uh, and two is to provide capability that we perhaps don't have within the bank. So in the instance that we'll talk about, as Chris mentioned, this is an augmented reality currency converter app, which probably sounds quite scary. And we absolutely don't have any augmented reality talent within the bank as it stands. So, so we looked beyond the bank and partnered with a company called Mazenix, who are a, a Scottish uh, tech startup. So a little bit about B Currency. So B Currency is an augmented reality currency converter app. That's the last time I'll say that. <coughs> uh, and it's available for free in the Apple App Store, so shameless plug. Uh, and, in, and simply put, uh, all those big convoluted terms, what it allows you to do is to point your mobile device at a price. Your device will recognize that price in a foreign currency. It will then do some number crunching in the background uh, against some real-time exchange rates, and it will present the, pr the price back to you uh, in a currency of your choosing. So the, the use case is very much, I am in a foreign country with a foreign currency, uh, preventing me from doing the, the manual sums in my head uh, B currency will take the weight off uh, for me. And its principle is that it's helping our customers uh, or prospective customers stay financially fit whilst abroad. From our perspective, there's, there's a big kind of brand play here. It means that we're hoping that people have a positive experience with our brand uh, and, and carry that forward when it comes to thinking about um, some of their uh, financial products. Interestingly, you know, quite timely for tonight, B Currency won an award last week, uh, last Thursday night. Uh, it was voted the most innovative product of the year at the FS Tech Awards 2019, so that's Financial Services Technology Awards. Uh, it was up against some really big players, uh, particularly some really big fintech startups that are getting a lot of headlines at the moment. So. For us, it was real vindication of the approach that we took and particularly the methodology, which is design thinking that we followed. Uh, it was a, a relatively bootstrapped project in, in banking terms. We spent very little money on it. Uh, there was a team of two people, myself and my colleague Ed, who has deserted me tonight. Um, and it was done in a very different way from, from how we would typically work. So we were delighted with that. 
This is essentially what we started with, uh, a blank sheet of paper, which to a lot of people could be particularly daunting. Uh, I know it is, it is for me. Um, and that's essentially where we, we, we relied heavily on, on the methodology. It, it gave us a kind of guiding light, something to, to sort of stick to uh, and provide direction. So when I joined, I joined the bank last March, um, almost a year ago to the day, I was handed travel, which, you know, that, that could be anything. So um, by adopting a methodology like design thinking, it helps you uh, put some structure around an otherwise really big question mark. So design thinking is an iterative process in which we seek to understand the user, challenge assumptions, redefine problems, and attempt to identify alternative strategies and solutions that might not be instantly apparent with our initial level of understanding. So going back to what I said at the start, I had no experience in travel. I was new to the bank. I had no, no experience working in banking. The, the last few lines in that sentence are particularly uh, prescient. So come up with solutions that might not be instantly apparent. So it's challenging assumptions. It's thinking about your end user rather than yourself. And it's forcing you to think a little bit out of the box. It's great because it kind of lands in the intersection of um, the needs of a business, the needs of the user, and technical feasibility. So it helps you land on a solution that, that addresses those three things, which is often quite difficult. When to use design thinking. So people tend to talk about a wicked problem or a, a simple problem. If it's a wicked problem, design thinking is perfect. Uh, if it's a little bit more simple, a little bit more obvious, then it's not typically a methodology we'd use. Um, however, uh, I won't go through all of these, um, but if it's a problem that you don't clearly understand, uh, if there's a degree of uncertainty as to what you're trying to build or address, if there's a degree of complexity, uh, if the data isn't readily available to you or not obvious, or if you have a, a great degree of curiosity around the problem, then design thinking is likely to be the methodology for you. Uh, on the other hand, if, for example, we have a real clear understanding of what the problem is, we have real clear sources of data with which to understand that and address that, then it's likely that, that you, should, you should look elsewhere. This is a, in a summary, in a, in a very simple nutshell. It's four, four steps, four very actionable steps that uh, you do not have to be um, an expert uh, to follow, which is the beauty of it. It boils down the process of concept product development into four steps. What is, so what is, the current, what is the current reality? What is the current state of play? What if, so that's imagining an alternative future. What wows, so that's put the, putting your proposed solutions into the hands of users and getting feedback. And then what works is testing that concept or product in a real live market environment. And hopefully ending those four stages with something that's been um, tested, iterated, uh, and prototyped and improved upon, uh, and giving you a degree of confidence and certainty that the product or service that you're putting out into the market will generate the commercial return that you hope for. This is that in a slightly different way. So again, if you can see here, what is, what if, what wows, and what works. Um, you could rephrase as discover, define, develop, and deliver. And what we're using here is a, a way of thinking called divergent and convergent thinking. So for each of the stages, if you see the wave going up and down, that's starting out with nothing, then opening your eyes to, to amass as much insight and information as you possibly can uh, through whatever means you feel appropriate, distilling that down into a real focused understanding of the subject matter, then taking that focused understanding, come up with hundreds, potentially thousands of concepts that might address that problem. A lot of them will likely be crap that you will never revisit again. Uh, but that crap is important crap uh, because that then helps you to, to distill down into something that's really uh, addressing the needs of the audience that you've learned about, the problem that they have, and the solution that you should take forward. So what I'm going to do is use B Currency, the product that I spoke about at the start, as a little bit of a case study and talk you through uh, how we started out at that blank sheet of paper that I showed you at the start, taking it through the four steps of the process, 
and uh, ending with a, an award-winning product. That feels, feels quite nice to say that. So what is, is, as I said, exploring the current reality? So these might be some convoluted terms, but we'll break them down. So essentially, it's a process of journey mapping, value chain analysis, and mind mapping. By journey mapping, I want to understand the journey that my uh, customer or potential customer goes on with a, within any given subject matter. In this case, it's, it's the, the process of travel. Value chain analysis is, is looking inside, looking at the business that you work for or own or, or whatever and understanding its capabilities and its value chain. And then mind mapping is a process of, of laying all that, that information, laying all your, your learnings out in front of you and starting to identify patterns that will inform the next stage. So in our case, uh, two sort of key images here, I don't know if you can see them so well. Uh, on the left hand side is our qualitative research. So that's just a you know, kind of rich insight that we amassed. And we did that by going out and speaking to as many people as we possibly could that fitted within our target market. So within the bank, we have some very defined customer types and we wanted to build a product that, that addressed the needs of one of those customer types. So we spoke to as many of those people as we possibly could that fell within um, that category. So that was as simple as myself, Ed, colleagues in the team here, identifying friends, family, people on the street, going into branches and talking to them about their experiences with tra within travel. There was no cost as attached to that. It was very much uh, a, a lo-fi process of, of getting out and speaking to as many people as possible. Then pulling all of that information back together and to probably two or 3,000 post-it notes, getting it up on a wall and starting to find patterns across the insights that we captured. You and I will have very, very different real-time experiences, but the emotional similarities with our you know, experience of travel will tend to be relatively consistent. And that process of uh, diverging, getting as much information as possible, and then sorting through that and identifying patterns is what's important there. It was then backed up by some quant uh, quantitative insight. Uh, and that was in the form of a very simple Google survey. So again, as a big bank, you might think that we would spend you know, thousands of pounds going uh, down the route of uh, insight and research, which we do in some cases, but in this case, um, it was a very simple Google survey that cost us the best part of, of uh, 25 pounds with a promo code, which helped. And that is taking some of the patterns that we started to, to identify in our qualitative insight from the people that we spoke to and trying to put some numbers against that. So over the course of a weekend, maybe getting two to 300 responses uh, for, for that small spend. All of that information then comes together. So this is what I'm talking about, converge, divergent thinking, and starts to distill down into what we see as being a relatively consistent customer journey uh, and the process in this instance of booking and going on a trip. So we broke it down into eight stages that was consistent across all the, speak the people that we spoke to, and that was research, budget, save, book, pay, leave, holiday, and return. So pretty, pretty standard, not, not groundbreaking stuff there. But then as we started to drill down into each of those stages, we started to get a feel for the problems or potential pain points that the, the audience would face at each of those stages. Um, so for example, um, research a holiday, everybody does that, but there's so much choice, where do I start? Uh, budget, but I'm unsure of what I can afford. Save, but I've developed really bad spending habits and so on and so forth. So against each of the stages of the customer journey, pulling out some problem statements, if you want to call it that. Then the kind of third level down was, okay, so each individual user has these problems, but what's our right as a bank to play in that space at that stage? So you could argue that research on a holiday is not really something that you would interact with your bank for. Potentially you could, but we felt that that wasn't something that was particularly pertinent for us to, to try to get into that space. On the other hand, saving for a holiday, well, that, that, there's, some, there's some alignment there. And then potentially where could third parties um, uh, work with us to address these problems. So anyway, long story short, what is the first stage of the design thinking process helped us to identify probably six key problems that we wanted to start to think about 
and start to ideate around as we went through the process. Number one, researching and choosing a holiday is a laborious, time-intensive process. Number two, people are often willing to accrue debt and pay back retrospectively rather than proactively save for a holiday. So there's this kind of holiday bubble mindset that started to emerge that people felt that because they were going on holiday, it didn't matter. Like all normal spending behaviour went out the window. I'll accrue debt and I'll worry about it later. Number three, group travel is a logistical nightmare, uh, particularly at the point of booking and paying and often results in one person missing out or losing out. So in any group dynamic, we found that there tended to be one organiser that person did all the legwork, pulling everybody together, but also, unfortunately for them, that was the person that ended up getting screwed at the end of it when it came to paying for things. <clears throat> Number four, people are often in the dark about how much they spent while they go away. Uh, re they rely on very manual methods of keeping track of that, and then, more often than not, they come back to quite a nasty surprise. Um, again, this kind of holiday bubble mindset, all spending behaviour goes out the window. Um, Add into that the whole foreign currency element of it and you start to have a bit of a recipe for disaster from a uh, financial management point of view. Five, foreign exchange and travel insurance, things like that are always left to the last minute if, if thought about at all. So very few people we spoke to booked their holiday and then went and booked their travel insurance. It's the sort of thing that they either did on the flight on the way to their destination or maybe two days into the holiday they remembered and did it if they did it at all. Uh, and then the last one, there's so much documentation at every stage of the process, especially for good travel. So if you've got your flights, you've got your accommodation, you've got your transfers, etc., etc., etc. There's a lot of paperwork there. So what we did was take those problem statements and turn them into what you might call a how might we question. So the next stage of this, which we'll come on to, is thinking about potential solutions. How might we is a good way to start thinking about how you might solve those problems. So it's essentially taking the problem statement, turning it on its head, and uh, almost making a kind of positive statement out of it. So if I take the, the final one, uh, one of them as an example, how might we better enable people to understand and track their spending while on holiday? So that's the first stage. Again, this might seem relatively simple, but it's some guardrails, something to keep you, uh, keep you grounded, something to keep you on track, uh, and, and we've completed that. The next stage is then taking everything you know and understand about the audience and the subject matter and starting to think about an alternative future or how you might address the problem. And that is two simple things, brainstorming and concept development. So in our scenario for B currency, we, uh, we took our how might, how might we questions from the what is stage. We got a cross-functional team together. Um, this is a big organization, so we've got lots of different skill sets. So we made sure we had someone from the business. We had technical people, uh, creative people, and then subject matter experts uh, all into a room, uh, all with different opinions, but uh, a common a common um, desire to, to solve problems. And again, we use that diverge, converge thinking to come up with concepts and then prioritize. So I think by the end of our brainstorming session, guided by our how might we questions, we had something in the region of three, 300 individual unique ideas that the team had amassed. Um, as I said, a lot of those were complete rubbish, um, but some of them were little nuggets and, and what those little nuggets allowed us to do was to start to chip away, potentially borrow from some of the other 300 ideas and start to hook them in. And, and you start to have a little bit of a direction um, coming together. I said 300, 100, there you go. So what we did was we took those 100, we got them down to six. So again, thinking of those how might we questions, each of these six uh, concepts that are represented by the, the diagrams on the, on the right, addressed in some way, there's how might we, qu uh, how might we uh, questions. We call these um, ad sets. Uh, you know, it's almost like a little advert for a, a hypothetical product. And what it does is it, it gives you a conversation starter. So when it comes to testing these um, concepts with your potential end users, you have something really nice and visual that very succinctly summarizes your idea. 
that you can put in front of them and they can very quickly get their head around what you're getting at. It's easier, I think, in my experience, to show something visual than to try and explain an idea because uh, it becomes subjective, you add your own slant to it, all that sort of stuff. So we took the six and we did lots of different things to try and get feedback on them. Uh, one of the things that we did to try and hack it a little bit was we created a website. So again, the kind of common thread throughout all of this is we tried to do it as, as economical as we possibly could. So there was very little spend behind this. This was a free Wix website. Um, it cost us nothing to, to spin up. Uh, and you'll see there's six tiles here. Each of those tiles represents one of the six concepts that were on the previous screen. Uh, and what we did was we put a little bit of money into Google AdWords um, against some travel related keywords in relation to money management. And we just spent all of our budget sending traffic to this landing page. Uh, and then we watched with interest to see how that traffic behaved when it hit the landing page. Um, and, and what it allowed us to do was to see, in a kind of rudimentary way I would admit, um, but it allowed us to see which of the six concepts, an audience that we weren't you know, um, speaking to or influencing what they gravitated towards in terms of um, travel money management solutions. Uh, and using Google Analytics, we could, we could quite, quite clearly understand the, the click-throughs, etc. cetera. Um, and one of them, we called it at the time Google Translate for FX. We actually had to, we had to turn off, um, we had to turn it off because it was just eating up all of the, eating up all the budget. So that, along with a lot, a few other techniques um, to to get to measure, um, sort of. Uh, user feedback at a very high level led us down the path of prioritizing one of those concepts and it was um, our currency converter. We called it Google Translate for currency or Google Translate for FX. I mentioned we had uh, an ad set. We also had some very basic, uh, we call them wireframes. It's just screens of how that solution might, might appear. Again, just a visual aid to put, put it in front of a user and get some feedback. So this was our prioritized concept. At this stage, we'd finished what if. We'd imagined our alternative future. We'd come up with lots of weird and wonderful solutions. We'd uh, distilled those down into a few leading candidates and we'd got some real-time customer feedback to help us prioritize one. So that one solution then goes into the next step, which is what wows. Uh, and that's us getting users to help us make tough choices. So as with any idea that you have, you become quite attached to it. You start to look at, look at it through your own lens. You make a number of assumptions based on your own experience. So this process is basically handing that back, warts and all to the user to guide your decision making. Uh, we do that through assumption testing and rapid prototyping. So, I mentioned we had some wireframes. What we did is at this stage was to actually build a technical prototype. So up until this point, the potential for an augmented reality currency converter was completely hypothetical. We had no idea if it was technically feasible. We had a rough idea that the users liked the idea of it. Um, but what we wanted to do was to do a little bit of a technical proof of concept to understand whether or not we were barking up the wrong tree. Uh, so we built a technical prototype, which is what you see on the right hand side of the screen. Again, minimal spend. Um, it took us about four weeks to build. We had a couple of developers, again, the core team working on it. Uh, and it was, it was kind of uh, very much contained. We then took that prototype uh, and got it into the hands of as many users as we possibly could. So again, to, to validate all the decisions we'd made to test whether or not our assumptions were correct and to get real-time customer feedback. Um, so within the bank, we had uh, something in the region of 70 colleagues that signed up to take it on holiday with them. Fortunately, we were doing this in the summer holidays. Uh, so we had staff that took the proof of concept away. Uh, again, we utilized our networks as much as possible to get some outsiders to test it. Um, we did some internal workshops. We invited lots of people in to give feedback. Uh, and we even had a couple of 
minor celebrities test it. So I don't know if anybody, any of you are football fans. Probably not, but the two guys in the middle used to play for Celtic. Wow. <laughs> Uh, but all of this was just, again, as in a very lo-fi way, um, using our networks as much as possible, not paying anybody any money to take this away, test it in a real environment and, and, and give us some real uh, actionable feedback. What we did as part of that was prior to conducting the test, we, we wanted to be as neutral and open as possible. So we defined some what we would call in the bank KPIs. You know, so, so what are our performance indicators? You know, what is it that will tell us whether or not this is worth pursuing? So we defined those and we measured those. So on return, the people that had used the app uh, were invited to fill out a survey. Again, I think it was a Google survey, so no cost involved, um, and answer a series of questions which gave us insight into how well the solution was received how well the technology worked, what it would mean for our, for our brand from a brand reputation point of view, and so on and so forth. And we measured those um, against our KPIs. And against each of the measures, although they're in red, they were actually really positive. So they by, by far exceeded anything that we had hoped. Um, one of the kind of key metrics in the bank that we use to measure customer satisfaction is something called the NPS, Net Promoter Score. Um, and the net promoter score was just through the roof compared to what we were, were used to. Um, so it gave us real concrete, um, reliable uh, data with which to, to make a data-driven decision. So we completed the first three steps. All of the signs were pointing to a, a kind of positive result. We got a lot of really good feedback. And now it was ready to go on to the final what work stage, and that was taking it to the market. So at this point, it was very much a controlled environment. It was testing with uh, people that we knew or colleagues or, or, or whatever. And this, this, this next stage is about putting putting it into a real live environment to see how it lands from a business point of view. Is it does it make good business sense? Um, so again, the, the proof of concept, which is on the left, was, was iterated upon uh, or, or improved further. And it looks uh, like what you see in the middle. So basically taking all the feedback that we'd received from our, our testing, um, spending a bit more money this time because we, we knew it was more of a safe bet so that we were able to take the, the reins off a little bit in terms of, of the investment. So getting some proper user experience designers to, to work on it. Um, and launching it in the app, Apple App Store. Um, so from our point of view, this was now open to all customers of the bank, non-customers of the bank. Uh, and what we did was we Im implemented something called Cumulus, which is an app um, performance management tool. So it helps us understand uh, how many downloads we're receiving, uh, how people are interacting with it and so on and uh, effectively adopting a test measure learn approach. So we're about now, um, about four months we've been live, we're about to now uh, make some further improvements based on the insight that we've captured and we'll continue uh, along that, that loop. So just to kind of reflect, coming to the end of the, the presentation now, so we've gone through our four stages, what is, what if, what wows and what works and that in principle is, is a design thinking approach. So we've put ourselves in the, in the minds of our user, we've designed for our user rather than ourselves, and at each uh, given stage, we've tested and validated that with our user. So what it's allowed us to do is make some really um, confident decisions along the way. What might have happened in the past um, as a bank or any other organization might have def defined from the, from the top, we want to build a currency converter and this is what we're going to build. They might have invested a lot of money, they might have invested a lot of time, but they might not have been confident that that would be a success. So what this process has allowed us to do is make measured decisions and have a degree of confidence that the product that we are launching to the market is going to be a sound one. And in a relatively short period of time, this, this might not translate, I don't know what you guys do on a daily basis, but for, for a bank, projects tend to be 
uh, can be very long. They can last years sometimes. Um, but what this allowed us to do was to get a product into the market from proof of concept to live in the app store in 12 weeks, which is pretty good going, I would say. Um, so going back to April last year, starting with a big question mark, start, starting with that blank sheet of paper, conducting our exploration what if phase in May, or what wows in June, and then um, taking it to the App Store in September. And then fast forward a few months to last night, you're going to be, I've, I've definitely got some mileage out of this, but winning an award for the product that we built and the, the approach that we took to build that product. So just some final key takeaways, things that I think are worth um, remembering, I guess. Uh, the, the design thinking has taught me uh, and why I'm such a big advocate of it. Uh, you need to learn to love your problem rather than a solution or an idea that you have in your head. Focus on the problem and the solution will come. Be prepared to kill your darlings. So that's a really difficult thing for for most people, I think everybody gets attached to their idea. They think their idea is the best. Design thinking makes really challenges that and makes you make some real tough decisions, the decisions that are the right ones. And that sometimes might involve you uh, killing your own idea. And have trust in the process. So there are points throughout the process that it's really tough going. And sometimes you think you'll be, uh, you know, you're, you're banging your head against the wall. You're not getting anywhere your ideas are rubbish, uh, or your idea is better than their idea, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the process, if you stay true to it, will guide you through. And uh, if you have a degree of confidence in it, then more often than not, you will end up with something valuable, whether that's a really great product or at the very worst, some really good learnings about your audience and the, the market that you're trying to build for. Uh, from our point of view, we learned that the travel space as a bank is, is ripe for disruption. Uh, there's some real commercial lineage there. Um, we obviously provide products like travel insurance, uh, foreign exchange. We offer a credit card which has some favourable rates on, on foreign travel. So what it's done for us, I guess, is focus the mind on, on that and, and have a real solid think about how we might address that going forward. So thanks for listening. I hope that was useful. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Yep. Have we got any questions for Jack? Um, um, could you put the point where you actually have ad sets yep. uh, and then your website, did you spend any time pursuing any of the other five? Good, uh, good question. What we, for the purposes of the, the presentation, um, I tried to simplify it a wee bit. What we actually did after uh, the what if stage was take three concepts forward into the, the, the what wows stage. Um, part of the reason why I admitted, uh, omitted that is I think a learning for me was that that probably clouded the issue a little bit. So we took forward the currency converter, one in relation to um, helping you book travel, another in relation to you being abroad and providing you with contextual information. Um, it probably clouded the issue a wee bit, uh, and in hindsight, focusing on one was probably the better way to go. Moni, you had a question? Um, I think you said it was a brand play, is that what you said at the start? Yeah. Um, it's not actually branded as Clydesdale Bank. Uh, is the intention to sell it as a technology? Uh, no, so one, one of the things that I probably should have mentioned at the start, so I work for Clydesdale Yorkshire Bank Group. Within that, you have Clydesdale Bank and Yorkshire Bank as individual entities. To complicate matters further, Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank have a digital brand called B, um, hence, hence the B currency name. So B is our digital product, to, you know, so um, you can down, you know, similar to the likes of a Monzo or a Starling, it's our kind of equivalent. Um, within B, we have something called the B store, which is a space within the app where we provide you with products that are, are beyond banking. So not just you dealing with your, you know, your day-to-day -day financial transactions, but tools like BCurrency that might help you in a kind of broader sense. Um, in terms of the, the brand play, we, we wanted to try and provide some utility at a point where you might have some friction um, 
you know, in this case, it's being at a till and I don't know, somewhere foreign and struggling to, to understand the value. The, the other angle to it, which I didn't mention, is we, uh, we, have an, we, we, we advertise product within the app. So we have a credit card, the B credit card. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's 0% on foreign transaction fees. So there's a nice kind of lineage there between the tool and the product. So we have a little tile that advertises the credit card. And one of, the th one of our sort of hypotheses that we wanted to test was could this become an acquisition channel for credit card sales? Uh, and interest, interestingly, it has. So we're starting to see the first credit card applications filter through. Not in huge numbers, but the, there's the, 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 the shoots of something there where people are using the app, having a good experience, and then clicking through and be beginning a credit card application and then completing that application. What is it? Um, in terms of the design thinking approach, is that something that you sort of brought into Clydesdale as a consultant or is that something that we're already kind of doing as a way of thinking about things? Yeah, um, so it's, it's a methodology that we've firmly embedded within this team. Um, I would say, uh, as far as I have gathered, there was pockets of it going on across the bank, but it wasn't firmly embedded in any way. Um, within the accelerator team here, it's become a kind of way of working. Uh, and the idea for our team is as much about um, creating products, but as 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 it is about you know showing new ways to to approach things. So as part of this, we, the idea was to try and take colleagues on. Uh, get them involved, get them exposed to the way of working, and hopefully that will then start to spread across the organisation. Yeah. In terms of the people comments, uh, travel is rife for the disruption. Um, we've always had the huge success of Skyscanner yeah. in Scotland, and uh, had one or two quite heavily funded you know, travel tech startups. But generally, maybe not too much. In the travel tech space, um, I mean, what do you feel that Scotland could or should be doing to, to do more in, in terms of travel tech? Really? It's interesting that you mentioned Skyscanner. So, as part of our, again, for the for, for the purposes of the presentation, try and simplify it. But uh, Skyscanner came up along to one of our ideation workshops. So, uh, I guess that would maybe answer the question: is is how can um, Scottish businesses work together? to create something bigger than the sum of its parts. So in our case, you have uh, Skyscanner who are you know, brilliant at what they do. We can bring our own um, sort of skills to the table. There's something at the minute, I don't know if anybody's heard of open banking. So open banking is a regulatory uh, piece which gives you as the user more ownership over your data, particularly in a, uh, well, in a financial sense you can, uh, for example, access one app which will pull all of your financial products into one screen, whether, whether it's with one provider or multiple. Whereas at the moment you need to go maybe into a TSB app, then into your Clydesdale Bank app and so on. Open banking starts to aggregate all of that and bring it all together and it makes the exchange of data much more free and fluid. Um, so I would suspect that the likes of Skyscanner would be interested in how they can start to, and other you know, companies can start to um, work with that regulation for the, for the end user's benefit. I have one final question. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on the previous question about the design thinking approach, I've used it before as well and I really, really love it. Brilliant. Uh, but how would you go in introducing it to a company that has never done it before, like in a team that has never done design thinking, and you want them to get on board with it? Yeah. So how, how would you make them uh, go with it? One thing that worked really well for us was, um, I think first of all, in order, in order to, to afford yourself the space or get the space to try something new, it's really important to have senior buy-in. So if you have, even if it's one person that has bought into you trying something different, then they can act as a little bit of a 
um, what's the word, a little bit of a kind of protector to give you the space to go and try something. So we were really fortunate here that we have senior stakeholders that are supportive of what we do. So that's number one, that gives you the space. And then number two is to, and what we try to do here is to invite people into your team and, and try and take them on that journey. So um, we did that in multiple ways. We invited colleagues from across the business to help us with our brainstorming and ideation. I mentioned that we had staff take the app abroad and by, by getting involved in the process and buying into it, they start to become advocates for it. So um, you start to, he they, they then start to kind of spread the message or spread the thinking um, back, back in their own teams and across the organization. It would take, a, it would take a while and you'll always have people that will um, it won't float their boat and that's fine. Um, but probably senior um, sort of sponsorship and involving people as much as possible. I don't know about you guys, I think that's uh, it's incredible. To, to develop an app within 12 weeks and win an award at the end of it is quite something. So thank you. Well, well done. So guys, can you please give a massive thank you to Jack. <laughs> Finish.